Thank you. All right. So um, I have about 50 minutes or so uh, of a presentation I'm going to talk to you about. And um, you know, just uh, make sure you cast those questions, because I know there's going to be a lot of questions uh, to be had. But uh, thank you for inviting me here. OK, so uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out something uh, that Bob Odell wanted me to point out, which is that he made a flub. Uh, so he told me at my lecture today that I need to get the programming schedule straight uh, and the channel straight. So this is a, uh, this America's Secret Space Heroes is actually on a Smithsonian channel. I guess he said the History Channel or something. Uh, and I think his, his particular part, episode five, is on June 11th. So don't miss that. A lot of people consider him the father of the space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. All right. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So how do we get the, the first uh, elements, the lightest elements, the most abundant elements in the universe? Uh, then I'm going to move over to uh, something that's more near and dear to my heart. Basically, one of the reasons why um, we're actually having this conversation in the room is stars, so stellar nucleosynthesis. Uh, so that starts with the first stars uh, and then goes on to what are called core collapse supernovae, uh, type 1a supernovae, um, asymptotic giant branch stars. These are various different types of, of stars in their evolution. And I'm going to break down those uh, uh, definitions a little more in the talk. Uh, then I'm going to talk to you about some rare nucleosynthetic events. Uh, and so basically, one I should say that nucleosynthesis is uh, the process by which we actually create new elements, and so that's through uh, fusion. And uh, so, so for the rare events, we have neutron star mergers, uh, black hole neutron star mergers, black hole accretion disks, uh, things of that sort. I'll speak a little bit about that. Then we have something that is really my main focus, which is galactic chemical evolution. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my research surrounding that and um, basically understanding chemical abundance ratio distributions. So I'm going to give you a, a, a quick understanding of the basics of that. Um, then I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about interstellar uh, uh, molecular production. Uh, and then in particular, we're going to focus on uh, exoplanets and what you can do with that. So there's a cool project I'm working on right now. And last but not least, uh, wrap it up with uh, some statements about societal chemistry and basically um, you know, the enterprise of doing science and what that sort of means uh, for us uh, as, as a civilization. Okay, so here, let me make sure I restart this. I'm glad it's loaded up. Uh, actually, it's not critical. So here we have um, an assimilation. So this is a big uh, supercomputer simulation uh, of a chunk of the universe. Uh, an idea is, uh, over time, from a relatively smooth distribution of what's called cold dark matter, uh, you end up with this cosmic web. All right. So uh, in fact, uh, the length here is the sides of the, the box. And so here it's roughly 25 megaparsec. So a parsec is roughly three times, uh, or roughly three light years. So you're talking about 75 million light years on a, on a side. And, 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 yeah. and, and understand that um, the size of the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years. So now, so, so basically, we, we see this, right? We, we have observations where we see the cosmic web and we see galaxies that are at these little knots here. So they're, they're at the intersections of where dark matter collides. And where dark matter collides, it's basically the backbone of the galaxy. So it, it, it helps to funnel uh, the hydrogen and helium uh, that existed at the beginning of the universe uh, into the centers of these uh, potential wells, these gravity wells caused by the dark matter. And then the gas gets on to doing what it does, which is um, to shed uh, 
basically the, the spin angular momentum collapse into smaller balls and then start forming stars. So let me run this forward. And so you see over time, and now we're moving over to the gas. Uh, now, and we're zooming in, you see here. So now we're at roughly six million light years across. And now you can start to see proto-galaxies uh, interacting with one another. Sorry. I'm gonna let this pause here for a second. And so let me, something else to point out here is that uh, this Z here is, is uh, what's considered redshift. And it's another way that astronomers and cosmologists uh, scale the size and distance uh, and the, basically the time elapsed uh, of, the gal oh, sorry, of the universe uh, over its lifetime. So, uh, so first of all, redshift starts off at a very high number. Uh, and, that's all, and it's basically based off of the fact that from the beginning, the Big Bang, about 300,000 years afterwards, uh, the universe cooled down enough that hydrogen could recombine with electrons to form, or that's to say protons can recombine with electrons to form hydrogen atoms. And once that happens, the universe becomes transparent to light. Uh, it becomes transparent to light that isn't of the precise frequency, which is like 13.6 electron volts. That's just basically a unit of energy. The light has to be in order to kick off uh, an electron and ionize uh, hydrogen. And so because the universe became transparent to all this light uh, from the heat of the initial Big Bang, it could then start traveling through space, basically unabated for billions of years. And then eventually uh, it reaches us. And so um, that actually what's re results in what's called the cosmic microwave background. And so we can run this clock back in terms of the redshift. Uh, uh, so the redshift of, of three is still um, close to uh, 10 billion years and, and beyond ago. So, that, so the, the weird thing is that the, the numbers don't really line up in a, in a lin linear sense. You have to get used to thinking about it. Um, let's see if this is fully loaded. Oh, no. It was working well before. Hmm. Sorry. Let's make sure I'm still on the web here. I am. Oh, no. Huh. Well, what we're going to do is go back and see if it will run one more time. If not, we'll just move on. Are you going to run this time? No? Oh, well. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> it's as it started. Oh, I, sorry, I can't. That's too bad. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Well, I can come back to it later, hopefully, and I'll just show you offline. Uh, okay, so. Um, so as I just described to you, uh, here's the, the Big Bang. Then we get this small, uh, very minute time period uh, which causes uh, inflation. And that's important because if inflation didn't happen, once again, we wouldn't be here. This is a, a very small time in the infancy of the universe where uh, quantum mechanics is mixed in with um, the broader structure of the universe. So uh, these small fluctuations in space get expanded rapidly before um, the fluctuations could smooth over. And so because of that, these fluctuations are frozen in a much larger infant universe. And that's what allows for structure formation to happen. So if the universe was completely smooth, you would never get 
um, any over densities. You would never get gravity pulling more in one direction than another. So, so this mathematician at MIT in the 70s came up with this idea of the inflationary model of the Big Bang. So before that, we just had this regular Big Bang. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, even that, even that uh, name is a weird, um, is actually a, uh, a weird backhanded um, uh, name for this phenomenon. So, um, so actually, interesting enough, early astronomers uh, in the 50s, this was coined by, I think, John Wheeler, Big Bang, was actually supposed to be like a, a knock against the theory. Um, because most astronomers believed in an uh, eternal, static, uh, infinite universe. And then the fact that there was actually a beginning, you know, uh, ruffled some feathers of astronomers, or scientists in general. <clears throat> so yeah, so the universe has this uh, beginning, but you need this inflation to give you these inconsistencies. Those inconsistencies allow for uh, first, dark matter, which we still don't know exactly what it is, that's why I call it dark matter, um, to start to clump up. And it's because of that clumping that we get structure, that we get galaxies, that we get stars, we get those stars generating new elements, you get planets around those stars, so on and so forth, and then we get to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> then moving on, there's a period uh, after, uh, like I said, 380,000 years where light is um, the universe becomes transparent to light. It's actually called the Dark Ages, which is ironic that the universe is transparent to light. Um, and this is because it's, it's transparent to the light that's left over from uh, the Big Bang, but there's no stars in, yeah. Why is dark matter called dark matter? It's, 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 it's simply, it's a uh, placeholder. It's because we don't know exactly what it is. We know it has to be there. Um, because it has gravitational effects uh, on the galaxies, both in clusters uh, and in individual galaxies. But we don't know exactly what it is. Um, and we don't know what dark matter, dark energy is for the same, same reasons. And that actually makes it much more the, the entire universe. And um, in fact, speaking of which, uh, so, uh, so, okay, so you have the dark ages. The universe is filled with neutral hydrogen. And it's also filled with, uh, so it's filled with like about 75% neutral hydrogen, 25% helium. Uh, and the cool thing is that that helium was produced by the heat and the pressure and the density of the early universe. So, yeah. White asked this question, where yeah. do the neutrons come from? Because hydrogen has no neutrons and helium does. Where do the neutrons come from? Yes, yeah, so, so, um, so there's also, um, the neutrons come from the same processes that make up all of these elementary subatomic particles. So you're, you get a blend uh, of protons. So, ah, so let me say this real quick. Before that, the universe is so hot that you have what are called these free quarks. So the quarks are the, the fundamental units of things like protons and neutrons, right? So they're just floating around, it's super hot, it's so hot that they can't combine to form protons or neutrons, right? Um, oh. Questions are great, but I think if we hold them towards the end, we have to make sure. Yeah. 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 I, I, do, I do appreciate the question. It's, it's okay. Okay. So, I, so hold, yes, exactly. Hold those questions. We're going to have a lot of fun at the end. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, we had the Dark Ages. Uh, you have this uh, split, and the cool thing is that. 25% of the helium uh, is produced by fusing hydrogen uh, atoms together. And that's simply because the universe was basically like the interior of a star from the first three minutes of the universe to the first 20 minutes. So over 17 minutes, the universe itself, just by its size and, and the amount of energy that's in it, is hot enough and dense enough to start fusing hydrogen into into helium, and so that turns off. And this is one of the reasons why we know the Big Bang theory works, is because you can actually compute this theoretically. You can, you can work back what we see from observations of the cosmic wave background, and you can say, okay, um, if we have this initial 
ratio of hydrogen to helium, and we know this Big Bang nucleosynthesis occurs, does that match the pattern of observations that we see uh, in the sky when we look at the cosmic microwave background? It does. It's one of the, the hallmarks of, of cosmology, um, that you can do something very precise with the universe. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, universe is continuing to expand, uh, and as it expands, it cools down. Uh, and so it gets to a point where it's cool enough that gravity can now really start having an effect. So now it's starting to pull this hydrogen and helium together to start forming the first stars and the first proto-galaxies. And so that ends the dark ages, because then the first stars start lighting up. And so now the universe is no longer dark. Okay? And so that's about 400 million years after the, the Big Bang. And then from there, you just see that basically galaxies start to form, more stars um, start to form, different types of stars now start to form because there's heavier elements in the, in the universe. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, development of galaxies, planets. And then you see this little, it's like a bell. You see how it's starting to curve out? This is, it's, a, it's weird. We... Uh, live in a very particular time in the, the uh, age of the universe where uh, dark energy is actually taking over the expansion. And so now not only is the universe sort of coasting um, in terms of expansion, it's actually accelerating. So that's what that curve out is. So the universe is accelerating in how big it gets. So, so I remember first learning um, about astronomy in, in some of my freshman classes back in the late 90s. And, you know, this was actually just being discovered. Dark energy was just being discovered. Um, I think, it, yeah, it was like 98 is what it, it was announced, that the universe is not only uh, expanding, but it's actually accelerating. And so before that, there was hope that the universe, I guess hope is a weird way to put it, but, but there, was, there was this idea that the universe could, like, end in a big crunch, or that there, it was an a oscillatory sort of um, situation where gravity would overtake the expansion and reverse it, and then it would crunch, and then, it, then you get a new universe out. And it, that was a nice sort of neat sort of oscillating universe theory. This, this sort of blows that out of proportion. This, most likely it's going to be a big rip, and we'd, no one has a clue what that means. Okay, so, um, and that's way, way off in the future. So, <laughs> so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, and that's what you're probably thinking. Okay, so, 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 so um, over here on the right, this is basically, it's, it's not important that you see all the details here, but this is um, the idea of this, this Big Bang nuclear network, and we're going to get back to nuclear ne networks in particular um, with um, stellar nucleosynthesis. But it's just the idea that you have these different ratios of elements formed uh, because they're all interacting in this high temperature, high density environment. Uh, and so you get various uh, isotopes of helium, helium-3, helium-4, uh, deuterium, which is the isotope of, of um, hydrogen. It's hydrogen with one neutron. Tritium which is hydrogen with two neutrons. You might have heard of heavy water. That's what people are talking about. Um, so that they're much rarer than just your proton and your electron. Uh, and then you even get lithium and beryllium formed. So this is very important because basically most of the lithium in the universe is, is formed by the Big Bang. So this is a, another tight constraint on what's happening, the, the physics of the, the Big Bang and Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And actually there's, um, there's still some issues to sort out in terms of the amount of lithium that we see uh, in the universe versus the, the, the theory. And I, I have a friend that's interested in working on that uh, as a cosmologist. Okay, so, um, so moving on. Now we're going to talk about stellar nucleosynthesis. So this is getting closer to the stuff that really affects us, minus the, the lithium and <laughs> uh, beryllium. That's, that's very uh, useful. And, you know, the helium, which is cool for making your voice sound weird. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, this interesting side note on the, he on the helium. Um, because helium is an inert, very light gas, uh, we didn't actually discover it um, you know, for, for a long time. And in fact, what we noticed in, 
absorption lines, when we look at the, the sun, and I'll, I'll show you some spectra of stars, is that we noticed in a particular spot, you had these absorption lines, and we didn't know where they came from, so we called it, uh, I think it was a nebulium. And then later on, people discovered helium and said, oh, that's, those are helium lines. And so this is another really critical thing, is that we can actually tell what elements exist in, in the stars, because we, we look at the spectrum of, of those stars. Okay, so, so here I have sort of the three ma major uh, nucleosynthetic processes in stars. So this is the three main ways that uh, stars act as uh, nuclear furnaces, building up uh, heavier elements from lighter elements. Okay, so the main one is the proton-proton chain, and this is near and dear to all of our hearts because this is how the, our sun works. So if a star is less than... Uh, 1.3 solar masses, we, we measure things in terms of the sun because, you know, we're human and that's our star, um, then it works by the proton-proton chain, this is what we call the PP chain. An idea here is that we have two uh, protons, basically helium nuclei stripped of their electrons, um, combined together, they give off some energy, this is what powers the sun, this little new uh, is a neutrino, and then uh, here you have um, a positron. Actually, they actually they do not even show the gamma. Where's the gamma? Oh, yeah, the gamma's lower down here. Okay, so you, you have the neut neutrinos, which partially powers the sun. You have positron, which is the opposite of electron. Okay, now you move on, and you have uh, uh, hydrogen with a uh, neutron, so that's basically uh, deuterium, and then you have another uh, proton come in. Here's where you get the, the energy, this gamma, right? So this is what's critical, is that the fusion, fusion by fusing heavier ele I'm sorry, lighter elements to heavier elements, what happens is the difference in the weight between the new element and the lighter element, that difference um, is basically measured by the amount of these neutrinos that come out, but more importantly, the light energy that comes out, these high energy uh, gamma rays, and that's what powers stars, that they, they sit there, and because of the heat and pressure in the interior, in the cores of the star, uh, pushes these atoms together. They want to fuse because of something called the strong force. Once you get them close enough, then they're like, okay, we'll be together. And then they give off this energy in exchange. And so the, the um, end result, this helium-4 nuclei, is lighter than four separate protons. And that is that, that's the key. That's, that's, the, that's what powers the stars. That's what allows uh, life on Earth to flourish, because then at the end, eventually, that light gets out. But it, it keeps the star up from, from collapsing, and then it continues to churn through its nuclear fuel. OK, so that's the PP chain. Uh, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or the CNO cycle, happens for stars that are more massive than uh, the sun, and in particularly, we're, we're actually pretty close you know, to that limit. So the sun is you know, only a third less uh, massive than it needed to be to be a star like this. Um, but in this case, basically, um, the star uses carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as a catalyst. Um, diffuse helium nuclei. Uh, and so, so there's a couple things. Like one, this process didn't occur for the first stars because you didn't have carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen in the beginning of the, the universe. So the first stars, um, they operate differently. One, they, they mainly operate by this PP chain, but even more massive stars that would normally do this don't. And so that's, a, that's an interesting point when we, we try to figure out where the first stars how the first stars operated um, uh, in the early universe. And so the idea here is that basically you have, it's, it's still taking in these protons, it's giving off energy, that's great. Um, and by combining with the protons, you turn carbon into nitrogen, and then it gets rid of a neutrino and a positron, it becomes carbon again, and then so, so there's a cyclic process 
that allows you to finally get to uh, the key um, the, the key product, which is basically going from nitrogen with an additional uh, positron or or sorry uh, proton, uh, and that's what allows you to, to to make this helium, and then you get back to carbon. So so this is what happens in more uh, more massive stars, and then of course last but not least is this triple alpha process. So now um, this is important. So um, Every star of a given mass will spend most of its time on something that's called the main sequence. And I'm going to show you a picture of that uh, in a little bit. But basically, it means that it's spending most of its time fusing hydrogen into helium. Okay? And so that's what this, all these first two processes are about. The triple alpha process is about fusing helium into heavier elements. Right? So this is good. This is, we need, you know, we're carbon-based organisms, like this is where all the carbon comes from. Uh, so the, the triple alpha process gives us the carbon, and then from there, you can continue to do this where you, you're now fusing uh, uh, carbon uh, into oxygen because you're adding um, helium nuclei, and actually we call helium nuclei, the reason why it's called triple alpha is because you have three helium nuclei, and in nuclear physics, a helium nucleus is an alpha particle. Okay, so yeah, so here's a nice little schematic of what happens here. All right, so you have two helium nuclei, forms your beryllium, here's your third one, forms your carbon, and then you just start adding them. See, so your oxygen, neon, magnesium. So this is what's happening. Um, well, this, this is what will happen in all stars later in life is that they've done burning most of their helium, and now they're ready to burn heavier elements in their core. And they're actually doing it uh, sort of at a futile pace, because at each stage, you get less and less energy out of fusing heavier elements. Um, and that happens all the way up until um, iron, uh, where you get a turnover, where basically, unfortunately, with iron for a star, um, you have to put more energy in than you get out. And because of that, that's basically the, the death knell for the star. So at the core, you form uh, a small uh, iron core, and every, all the heavier, the lighter shells on top of it, so shown here, are trying to burn uh, each of these elements into the next shell down. But once you get to iron and uh, nickel, you can't get any more energy out. And so the, the star really feels that and basically means that it started, it, it, um, the whole core starts to implode on itself uh, because it's, it basically uh, it quickly produces a whole bunch of iron uh, and nickel as it becomes hotter and denser, but it's no longer getting enough energy to keep it from collapsing. And so that's what forms a core collapse supernova. And this actually happens um, you know, less than a second. An entire large star, the core collapses in less than a second. It rebounds and gives you this amazing explosion. Uh, okay, so uh, here, so I mentioned the main sequence, horizontal branch, I haven't mentioned that yet, an alpha process. Here is a very famous diagram. This is called the HR di diagram. It's um, named after two astronomers, Hertzsprung and Henry Russell. Uh, and actually, um, it probably should be named after, uh, you know, a, a number of their computers. And um, <laughs> if you guys know, actually, you guys probably would know, but more better than me, who, what computers were back in the day, computers were people. Um, and, in, and predominantly in astronomy, they were women. And, um, you know, uh, in astronomical history, a lot of the greatest discoveries were actually found by women in those labs, but they were not allowed to actually observe at the telescope. So they had to look at the data that was collected by the big boys, um, and they found the discoveries, and then, you know, the big boys would take credit for it. Um, so, so indeed, it was the computers. It was the computers that, that said, okay, we're looking at a whole bunch of different stars, and all these stars seemed to align 
if, if we look at the luminosity of the stars, so how bright they are, um, and we could start to figure this out because we actually can figure out distances to stars by a method called parallax, um, and which is basically, uh, you know, surveyors use this as sort of triangulation. So if I put my finger out here and I close one eye and then I switch, I can see the shift there. Um, and by seeing that shift, I can actually know how far away the, my finger is. And so, uh, so astronomers use this technique by looking at a star at one point in time in the year and then looking at it again six months later and using the orbit of the Earth around the sun to figure out uh, how much that shift is and then figure out the, the distance to those stars. So we can start to figure out exactly how luminous those stars were for the things that were relatively nearby. And so, so the computers could put this on this diagram and we could also figure out surface temperature by color and other means and they started to see that there was this, most of the stars lied here, which is the main sequence. And that's all the stars that are burning hydrogen into helium right now. And that's where our star is. Our star is actually right about here. Um, or actually, let's see, actually, it's like probably right about here, actually, to be more, because that's 6,000. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is actually rather accurate, because if it was here, um, there'd be a problem. Uh, uh, if it was here, it'd be hotter, so that'd be problematic for our same um, orbit, but also uh, if here it would be basically saying that um, with the current age that it would already be on the red giant branch. So the cool thing is when you look at this diagram, stars that are hotter, more luminous, they burn through their fuel faster. So the hotter you are, like the, the faster you burn through your fuel, and it means that you peel off of this main sequence and you end up going to the red, what's called the red giant branch. And the reason why it's called that is because the star expands greatly and so its outer layers cool off and they become red, okay? And um, the reason why is because that, as I was telling you before, the core will contract as it's trying to get more energy out. So what, what, what's happening? When uh, our star uh, burns through, say, 90% of its hydrogen, it's going to have a little hydrogen shell and it's going to have mostly helium in the core. And what happens is that helium has not gotten hot enough to start fusing into heavier elements. So, but now you've gotten to a point where the hydrogen is, there's not enough hydrogen burning to support the core. So then the core starts to contract. And when it contracts, it heats up. And it's still contracting because it's waiting to get to that temperature and density where uh, uh, helium fusion can, can turn on. And as it does that, that heat is given off to the envelope. And that's what expands the star. And that's what makes it a red giant. Okay, and so that's why you see at this point, the triple alpha kicks in. Right, because now this, the core becomes hot enough to start fusing helium uh, atoms together. Uh, and so that begins this cycle where there's a horizontal branch and you don't need to know those details in particular. But basically, that's, that's the life cycle. The star spends most of its time on the main sequence uh, and then it spends the second most amount of its time as a red giant, uh, which is gonna happen to our star in about four and a half billion years. Um, so we have some time before it engulfs the, the earth <laughs> um, to, to figure out what we want to do. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, of course, eventually for a lower mass star, it's not going to go supernova. It doesn't have enough mass to do that because it doesn't have enough mass to burn up to iron in its core. It only has enough mass to burn up to carbon and oxygen. Uh, it'll become this what's called a white dwarf at the end. It's sort of a less than dramatic ending. But, you know, like I said, we have a long time for that to happen. Okay, so those are the basics of stellar nucleosynthesis um, for what's called these alpha elements. And that's critical to some of the work that I, I work on. Um, there's also what's called this asymptotic giant branch. So, um, so same sequence here. And basically, between here is where you start producing all the different elements. So I, like I was saying, Triple alpha starts right about here. And then now you're burning uh, uh, helium into carbon. Well, this asymptotic giant branch 
um, is basically burning carbon into oxygen, oxygen into neon. That's, so we call it asymptotic because basically the star will bounce back and forth depending on its mass. And if it's massive enough, it will bounce back and forth all the way at the iron, like we said, and then it'll become a supernova. If it's not, eventually, you know, it'll get to the heaviest element. It can uh, fuse given its mass, and then it'll, you know, become a white dwarf, so on and so forth. But the cool thing is that in that process, you get these, what are called these S process um, elements. And that has to do with the fact that there's an interplay between the core and the envelope of the star. And what the core is doing, it's, you know, it's, it's this very hot interface. And there's um, convection uh, in the envelope. So it's sort of like uh, maybe convection in your, your coffee or whatnot. So it's a, a convective flow. And that's bringing this sort of fresh material from the envelope to the interface of the, the core. And so it mixes in a little bit, and then it gives us some of these other elements that you wouldn't never, uh, never would never get from the regular triple alpha process. Um, and so, there's, so the stars are really cooking. You know, they're they're doing various different things to produce all of the elements of the periodic. Well, most of the elements of the periodic table. Um, right. And so this so this comes down to a process called neutron capture. So you've already had a question about neutrons. Neutrons are sort of critical to how we get to these heavier elements. Um, and so the S process is named this because it's slower than uh, basically the decay of neutrons. So free neutrons, um, which I think the reason why he asked this question, is the free neutrons don't live long outside of a nucleus. All right? they, need very, they have to be constantly reproduced. If they're in a nucleus, they're stable. Outside of a nucleus, they break apart into a proton and an electron and uh, a couple other particles. So, um, so you really need a environment that's producing a lot of free neutrons, but also dense enough that it's going to push some of these neutrons into uh, other elements to produce the heavier elements, because then some of those neutrons decay, give you new pr protons that are connected together, and that's a different element. OK, so, so, so in these asymptotic giant branch stars, they do this by the S process. And so there's literally. Um, different chemicals on the periodic table that are only produced or mainly produced through this S process, through the slow capture, relatively slow capture of, of neutrons. And so you got cadmium, uh, 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 silver, um, tin. Okay, so, so that's the S process. Uh, in core collapse supernovae, like we're seeing here, um, that's for stars that are larger than eight solar masses. Um, and so what's left is a neutron star. And what that liberates is the elements that were produced, like these alpha elements, so calcium, uh, magnesium, oxygen, titanium, with a little bit of iron. Uh, and then also, Um, and, al and also some of these were called R process elements. So the, the important thing about um, supernovae is that they, in the collapse, they produce a environment where you, you produce tremendous amounts of free neutrons. And, you, and it's only in this highly energetic um, process, one of the few highly energetic processes, that you can actually fuse the heavier elements. So all the heavier elements, or most of, of them, come from the supernovae. So all the elements up to iron come from your regular star living its life. All the heavier elements come from the most massive stars actually exploding. So, And so what's cool about this is it sets up two different types of outputs, or what we call yields. <clears throat> For a core collapse supernova, it produces a lot of oxygen. And in fact, oxygen is the third most abundant uh, element in the universe, uh, in part because of, because of this. So, uh, and then you have uh, neon, magnesium, and then a little bit of iron. That's that blue here. A little bit of carbon, so on and so forth. 
So, um, so, this, so here's the, the R process. I'm going to show you a cool video of this here. But the idea is that, like I said, the R process is this rapid capture of neutrons. So there's tons of neutrons around, and they want to be captured, and you want to produce certain elements here. So now, uh, nuclear physicists can actually look at this process, and you can only produce certain elements from the R process. And so now, uh, in their parlance, you talk about the S process versus the R process, and what are the origins of the elements. Okay, so before getting on to that, here's your other type of supernova. This is called a type 1A. Uh, and this is actually the brightest supernova uh, in the universe. And it, it involves uh, what are called white dwarfs. So remember I was telling you about the end of the life of the sun, it'll become a white dwarf. Well, it's either, we actually don't know, and it's probably both, but it's either that you have a red giant, so you, so, oh, let me just say that. So there's a lot of, most stars, in the universe exist in binaries, okay? So, um, or, or higher order systems. Uh, so we're actually on the rare side if you count both binaries and uh, tertiary, the higher order um, couplings of different stars. Uh, so either you have a binary system where you have one star that already became a white dwarf, uh, and you, know, uh, you can actually tell that based off of mass, the more massive star will become a white dwarf first. And then the lower mass companion will be in its red giant phase. And this star is still pretty dense, so the core of the star is still half a solar mass, or, um, yeah, roughly speaking. So, uh, so it will pull off some of the outer layers from its companion star, if it's close enough, form this accretion disk, start accreting material, and the idea is that once you get over this certain mass limit on the white dwarf, which is called the chandar sekar limit, um, then that, that white dwarf will explode, forming, trying to form new elements. And that gives you this huge uh, supernova. So this, so this star is in this galaxy far away. So you can see... You know, the rest of the galaxy here is like a dust lane. Here's the center of the galaxy, which is pretty bright. Tons of stars here. This star almost outshines its entire galaxy. That's how bright they are. And in fact, it's these type 1As that we use to actually figure out that the universe was indeed expanding. So the whole project was looking at a whole bunch of these type 1A supernovas across the universe and finding that the ones that are further out were even further than they should be if the universe was just expanding normally. The uh, other scenario is that you just get two white dwarfs, like they had to go, this other one went through its full evolution, and that these merge. Okay, so the main thing is that this leads to a different um, breakdown of, of element production. For these type 1As, you mostly produce iron, and then a little bit of oxygen and magnesium. And so this is really critical to understanding um, the abundances that we see in various stars throughout the galaxy. Okay, so we covered this. Let's move on to the rare events. So here's a neutron star merger. So up to a few years ago, uh, we weren't certain where gold comes from. Uh, and we're not certain of where, and gold's an R process element. So we weren't certain, and we still aren't, although this is probably the best um, current idea, which is that uh, you have these two neutron stars that are left over from uh, a binary of massive stars, and they collide. And because they're neutron stars, they are neutron rich, because they're basically large, uh, 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 very compact objects that are only uh, mostly contain neutrons. So when they combine, you get your, your protons from the energy, but you have tons of neutrons, and that's what allows you to get these what are called R process neutron rich elements like uh, gold and other R process elements. So, so, so that's one particular scenario. Also, another one is rare supernovas that maybe. Are, are capable of producing those environments as well. Okay, so here, 
Yeah. So like I said, so here, here's, the, here's the cool part for here. So this is a, a diagram of the atomic number for different elements uh, on the y-axis. Uh, so that's a z, z. And then the number of neutrons on the x-axis. And so this, this green patch here is what's considered an R process. And so the cool thing is that in this, R, in this highly energetic um, scenario, this process, basically you form elements that look like this, that are extremely neutron rich. You can imagine um, you know, like a line that's diagonal here, which would be equal numbers of protons and neutrons. So become very neutron rich, and then it's so neutron rich that a lot of those neutrons decay. Like you, you can only pack so many neutrons into a, a nucleus. And so that's why, part of the reason why you get radio, radioactive decay. And so they decay back onto this stable patch of, of elements. So you get stable nuclei in the middle, and then you get these some exotic nuclei where they fall back onto. And these, are, these ones are also still like radioactive around the ones that, um, well, um, we're most accustomed to. Oh, okay. So here's uh, an actual simulation of this. So you get rapid climb up to, this is the R process here. And this is, basically it's just running through time. And it's running through, this is the solar abundance. This is the, of, of all the different elements here, measured by their atomic mass number. And then you see over time, they actually fall back on to the stable track. And so this is what nuclear physicists work on, how, to understand how this, evolution happens with the R process. And then they look for, with astronomers, they look for different phenomenon in the universe that can reproduce this. Okay, so, so and that's, that's to do this, to get to this. This is the uh, solar system abundance uh, taken by the sun and, and, and by looking at samples of, of uh, asteroids. Um, or meteors on, on Earth. Here is, uh, you got hydrogen and helium up here, clearly the most abundant um, elements in the universe. Uh, then you got lithium way down here. All this was, like I said, produced in the Big Bang. And then you start having the, the stars, first stars form, give you your carbon and oxygen and uh, nitrogen ne and neon, and then you get more massive stars that uh, you know, produce, like I said, neon, silicon, uh, calcium, titanium, up to iron. And so you get these different peaks because of these different processes in different types of stars. Uh, and then all the elements heavier than that, or like I said, most of them, are coming from these, the supernovas, the neutron star mergers, so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's like the, the nuclear physics part. Now we're getting to what I think is, is more fun is sort of the interpretation of the uh, um, observations that we see, right? So uh, here um, I have various sets of spectrums from different types of stars. Uh, and they're color coded based on the rough color of the stars you would see, except for green, because green stars don't exist. Um, <laughs> it is a cool reason why green stars don't exist. Um, in fact, our sun should be a green star. Um, its peak uh, intensity, so that's the peak of its what's called its black body curve, uh, lies in the blue. I'm sorry, in the green wavelength range. But the problem—well, let's say the problem. W what happens is that um, there's enough light, both blueward and redward, of this green peak that we interpret it as white. So, so, in fact, if you go into space, our sun is white, it's not yellow. The reason why it's yellow is because we're looking through atmosphere and it's scattering the blue light from, from the sun. So, um, so you have, but you do have these true red stars if you go out in a you know, nice dark sky. In fact, if you look at Orion, you see Betelgeuse, it's a red supergiant. It's a very massive star, um, but it's in this red giant phase, and so it's, it has a cool outer layer. Um, and then the most massive sort of main sequence stars uh, are blue. And the cool thing is that they're stacked up in terms of their brightness and that they, they don't overlap. And that's because 
if you integrate under the curves, that's the total energy that's coming from the surface of those stars. So it's coming out in different wavelength bands. And what's the other thing to understand is that the absorption features, or these little dips, that's absorption due to the individual elements in the atmospheres of those stars. So as light is trying to come out of the center of the star, it's being blocked and reprocessed by various elements in the star itself. And so you get all these absorption lines in them. Uh, and it's easier to do this for cooler stars because you get, in cooler stars, you actually get molecules that can exist uh, in the outer layers of the star. That is, and hotter stars, it's hot enough that it breaks those molecules apart, so you have less absorption. And that's why this hotter star looks like it's uh, sort of less impressed by the, its elemental makeup. OK, so what's cool about this? Well, uh, as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson said in uh, Cosmos, Space Time Odyssey, uh, you are witnessing the marriage of physics and astronomy, the birth of my own field of science, astrophysics. It was breaking up the light in the uh, solar spectrum and no noticing these absorption lines and noticing that they corresponded with the line patterns that we saw for elements that al allows us to actually talk about what's happening in the universe. We use those absorption lines to figure out redshift so we know what the rest frame where uh, a line of hydrogen should be and then we look at a star or a galaxy further out and we see that that line has gone from uh, I think it was like 65, 56 or something like that to maybe 7,000 and that's because it's been redshifted a little bit um, and so Hubble used that to figure out the expansion of the universe. And then we can literally read the lines how deep they are uh, to figure out how much of the, the given elements are in that star. So that's, that's where the astrophysics comes in. Okay, so stepping uh, away from that, now we have a means of figuring out uh, the various abundances of elements in individual stars. We know where they come from, so we can think about the, the chemical evolution of the galaxy, uh, and now we have tracers of it, and we can start to think about how the galaxy is actually structured. So, uh, so here we have metallicity and abundance distributions. Metallicity is, is basically the measure of the amount of iron to hydrogen in the atmosphere of a star. And the cool thing is if you look at the Milky Way, we have this distribution. So this is, we live in what's called the population one uh, area of the, of the galaxy, which is the disk of the galaxy. And that's the most metal rich. That means that these stars have had the most generations of stars before it produce elements. They inherited those elements, and then they continue producing more elements. And then the next generation inherited those elements. And so you can actually look at the growth of the amount of elements heavier than helium uh, in the universe uh, due to where those stars lie in the galaxy. Uh, Contrary to where the disk stars lie, where we are, um, you have what's called the halo, and that's made up of these really metal poor stars, and that's because they come from uh, different galaxies and bodies that didn't have a lot of generations of stars. They had a much, what we call, lower star formation rate, which means you weren't producing many elements over time. Uh, and we can actually look, we can slice up the galaxy in terms of height above the disk where we live, and that's working into uh, the halo, but also what's called the thick disk, and that's both looking back in time and is also looking at different types of origins for the stars that we see, and uh, basically this is a schematic showing how the uh, metallicity distribution shifts. So this is basically where the disk is. And if you go down, I don't know why it's down, it's better if you looked up. But basically going down is like looking at different heights above the disk. And you can see this whole distribution shift towards lower abundances. And that's because you're now probing this halo instead of the disk where we live. Uh, another cool thing is that there's this really rather tight relationship 
between the average metallicity in a galaxy. So if you take the average of all the stars in a galaxy and you figure out what's this av the average content of iron to hydrogen in each galaxy, well then there's a tight correlation between the mass of the galaxy as measured by the luminosity and its average metallicity. This also makes sense. So if I have more, if I form more stars over the lifetime of the galaxy, well I was also producing more metals. So now you can start to use the chemistry to track the actual evolution of the, of the galaxy itself. And so this is what I'm showing here is that um, for a while star formation gives you a particular ratio in terms of the elements you see. So here you have a supernova yield plateau, we call it, uh, of alpha to iron elements. We take a ratio of the amount of iron and alpha elements, so say like magnesium, uh, in, in a star, or sorry, in individual stars. And we could, oh man, sorry. I don't know why it's acting up like this. Where's normally? Oh, here we go. Perfect. Oh, if I run it again. OK, yeah, good. So, um, and so you can make this trade-off between these core collapse, what we call type 2 supernovae, and these uh, type 1a supernovae, right? So now a little bit of iron, a lot of iron. A little bit of iron gives you a high plateau, right? You're dividing by a, a small number. That's why you get this high plateau. The type 1a's kick in because of this binary, it takes time for those stars to evolve. It takes at least a billion years. So there's a delay before those start adding uh, iron, predominantly iron, and that turns the ratio over because now you're dividing by a much larger number. Okay, and so we, got, we actually see those patterns, which I, it was there, but for some reason it wanted to turn off. So I'm going to show it one more time real quick so you can actually look at the patterns. Um, oh, actually, no. I will show you later in questions. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so, so we can actually track that, those patterns in individual dwarf galaxies and in the Milky Way, and we see those various turnovers. Um, which is, which is um, related to the mass of those galaxies and hence the star formation history of those galaxies. Uh, here is a really cool project uh, done by Keith Hawkins, um, who is now at the Simons Foundation in, in New York. And what he did was, was look at various different chemical uh, planes. Uh, he looked at uh, carbon plus nitrogen over iron and this, like I told you, alpha over Fe. Uh, aluminum versus iron, and by making all these different cuts, he was able to separate uh, cleanly in a way that hasn't been done before different parts of the galaxy. And that's because while there's some overlap in two dimensions of chemical abundance space, if you look in more dimensions of chemical abundance space, you start to realize that you can find these clean cuts. And so this is what's getting into uh, what's called chemical tagging. Um, and like I said, I, I like to think of this as sort of DNA analysis. So how do I find the right combination that are markers that tells me you're definitely from here and not from here? Okay. And so, well, so why, why do we even think that this is a thing to do? Well, in part is because if we look at our own halo, all right, so now we're looking outside of the plane of the galaxy, and we're looking at this small, diffuse, um, collection of stars that orbits the, the disk of the galaxy, uh, what we see is we see these streams. We see that it's not smooth, but there's actually disrupted dwarf galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. And they were disrupted from the tidal forces of the center of the galaxy. And so, um, actually, my, one of my advisors claim to fame uh, is actually uh, doing simulations, dynamical simulations, to pinpoint where the tails of these streams would be for one uh, galaxy, dwarf galaxy called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. So we knew where the core of the Sagittarius was. Um, but before, in the 90s, we didn't have powerful enough telescopes, surveys, uh, looking at the halo as a whole to see where the streams were. And she, by dynamical arguments, was able to say, look here. And, and, and train your telescope, because it takes a while to build up the image. So you're going to have to train your telescope in this part of the sky, and you will see the, the, the streams uh, or the tails, and indeed, 
they did. So, um, so here's the, the northern uh, sky is what you would see of, of Sagittarius, and here's the southern sky. And so these are streams that wraps around the entire galaxy, and it's being ripped apart by the galaxy. And we have a whole bunch of these streams throughout the halo. So we call that substructure of the halo. And so you can look at, at it in terms of dynamics. What I worked on is looking at it in terms of chemistry, of course. So, so here is a simulation that, uh, once again, my advisor did at, at Columbia, where uh, here's like the disk of the galaxy. You have a whole bunch of dwarf galaxies falling in. They're color-coded just so you can see where the stars in those galaxies end up. They end up forming streams. This is a natural occurrence due to tidal forces in the same way that the, the moon acts on the oceans. Uh, so you get what's called tidal disruption. And so you get these clouds um, that are left over in these various streams. So you can do that in terms of dynamics, but you can also do it in terms of chemistry. So here is observations of various stars from various types of dwarf galaxies and also our halo. So the green are stars from our own galaxy's halo. Blue is from what are called low-mass dwarf Sorotto galaxies. So remember, low mass means low star formation rate, means low buildup of, of metals and other uh, elements. Um, and then you have Sagittarius. So I just showed you actual um, images of the stars in Sagittarius. Sagittarius uh, is a much more massive dwarf galaxy that uh, fell into the Milky Way and is being ripped apart. So it's more metal rich. Um, you got the LMC, which is, you, if you ever go to the Southern Hemisphere, you can see it with your naked eye looking up. Um, it's, the, it's the two galaxies that we can clearly see uh, with our naked eye, and they're named after Magellan when he circumnavigated the world uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. So you have um, those stars here, and that's, at, that's actually a massive galaxy as well. And you can see most of its stars are, are what are called more metal rich. Let me also say something about these numbers here. Um, this number is the log ratio. So basically, all this means is that um, zero is where the sun is. Okay, so zero and, and zero here is solar. So that's where our sun sits. Um, and then uh, minus one means you have a tenth of the amount of, of iron as the sun. So a tenth solar, uh, a hundredth solar. A thousand solar. So it's, if you remember your logs from a long time ago, that's that's how we we measure it. <clears throat> okay, and so that's why we consider these very very um, yeah extremely metal poor, uh, very metal poor, metal poor, solar, and then there's actually some stars that are uh, metal rich, and, and so on and so forth. So this is just a way of us figuring out how they relate to the solar abundance. Okay, so the cool thing to notice is that they, these stars spread out in different parts of this chemical abundance space, okay? So you can now try to reproduce this in simulations, and what you find is you can make the same sort of distribution in chemical abundance space. So that's this plot here um, from my, my thesis work, um, <clears throat> which was analyzing uh, my advisor simulations and looking at the chemical patterns here. And here I've overlaid the mass of the uh, progenitors, so that the, the mass of the galaxy that was torn apart and, and donated to the halo of this Milky Way-like uh, simulated galaxy. And so you see the low mass dwarf steroidals uh, live here again, and the more higher mass, you see red, red here, um, stars live here. And so you could, because you can split up um, the origins of these stars in this chemical abundance space, you can now ask, how do I analyze this distribution to recover the, what's called the accretion history of the galaxy? And, and that actually feeds into a lot of our understanding of cosmology and how galaxies form. And so I've basically said that, but I'll, I'll point it out a little more in detail. So we had the same sort of... Uh, Outlay and the idea is that you can make these templates from the simulations where stars are donated to different parts of this distribution based off of the mass. Okay, so, all right, so that's, so that's the galactic chemical evolution stuff. Um, 
Another cool thing is to bring it back closer to home. So now we're in our own galaxy, we're in the interstellar medium. And the cool thing is that we form all these different types of um, chemical uh, molecules, um, both organic and inorganic. So um, you have these um, polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbons that are sort of like cigarette smoke in space. Um, we get buckyballs in space, um, acetylene, uh, amino acids, uh, uh, ethane, formic acid, uh, and, and actually, well, uh, RNA here that's on Earth, that's on a planet, <laughs> so, so we only know one. But if, you know, in terms of the diversity of, of elements that naturally happen in interstellar space, and also if you, if you count planets as a uh, small, special um, microcosm of the interstellar medium, uh, you know, the interesting part is how many of these elements that we think are precursors to life exist out in space. Okay, and then this is just a long list uh, about a number of atoms. Uh, so not much to see here, but just for you know, your, your amusement of what exists out in, in space. All right, so, so this is um, something I'm working on uh, right now, and it's thinking about Earth as an exoplanet. So other people have, have, have thought about this uh, for a while. Astrobiology is a, a booming industry these days with all the discoveries of, of exoplanets. Uh, and so what I thought about is, well, if you were an alien civilization uh, looking out in space and, and trying to understand if there's intelligence out there, people have thought about like radio signals, the SETI works on this stuff. But there's another way to think about this. If you have a dedicated survey over many years looking at many different stars uh, in the galaxy, um, then could you detect the change in the chemical composition of, the, of, the, of, sorry, of Earth over time? And that's because of what we've been doing to uh, Earth over time for the last 12,000 years. So when I started off this project, I focused on the Industrial Revolution. So, he, so here is, um, from ice core samples in Antarctica, um, the mean methane level in parts per billion uh, over the last 800,000 years. And you see that it fluctuates, and these fluctuations are due to ice ages, right? So due to uh, glacial and interglacial periods. So uh, when it's, it's hotter naturally, more methane gets released, then the earth cools down and the methane is recaptured and it, and it dips. But here's the mean level, and then you can see it shoots up right at this edge. So that's like the last 2,000 years, and then there's um, a period right before that that's also pretty high. And so here's the last 2,000 years. And here is the, the yearly mean level from, from, from ice core samples and other samples. And you see the me meteoric rise. This is the start of the Industrial Revolution. OK? So, so uh, the question was, if you had the right telescope, could you actually detect the change um, in atmosphere? So not just the amount, but the actual change over time. And, you know, by looking at the record, is that change different than um, natural changes? And so what we, what we were able to see here, so now if I plot the mean decadal growth rate or the change in the methane, we see it also oscillates uh, over time. And in, the numbers don't necessarily matter here, but just in terms of the over, there's a mean rate here. And then you can see it really spikes up at the last part, uh, and that's you know, 12,000 years and then the last 2,000 years. Uh, and here's a trace of that, that change as well. And so uh, when we're looking at this, here I have the glacial approximate maximum level. It's actually pretty high. It, it's actually higher than most of the Industrial Revolution. And so when I first saw this, I was like, all right, well, uh, maybe you can't see this, or you can't really say anything significant. Except for I look back in the literature, and actually there's a time uh, in uh, Earth's history early Earth history, where um, the meteoric rise in carbon was actually greater the Industrial Revolution, and it was still due to us. And so, uh, tw you know, roughly 12,000 years ago is when we started uh, basically settling down, we started clear-cutting 
um, trees to make uh, agriculture a, a bigger thing. And, and actually, particularly, th this um, spike is due to, um, basically, the people who study this say it's due to the Chinese. The Chinese clear-cutting trees and in, in, in rice paddies actually producing a tons of methane. So that, that combination of, of early anthropogenic um, production of methane is what this maximum level is here. So instead of this being a, you know, a, a, de a detriment to my project, I was actually, this signal exists hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of years before the Industrial Revolution. So the question is, is could you see either the Industrial Revolution or this uh, rapid change early on um, uh, over time if you have a dedicated survey? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, okay, well, almost done. All right, so, um, so the way you would do this is you would look at a star uh, and you would do this eclipse spectroscopy. So you have the star spectrum and you have the planet spectrum and then you see the planet go behind the star and you see a little dip uh, in light because the planet light is now um, blocked by the star's light and you only see the star. And it's this difference, and here this is in microns, so this is the infrared. So, you, so you'd be looking at different parts of the infrared spectrum um, where you could see absorption lines from specific elements. And you would see this dip, and the idea is that you would look to see how that dip changes uh, over time, so over years. You would see a slight change in this dip. Actually, it would, it, the dip should increase, um, and that's due to the absorption in the, in the planet itself. And so we already do this for massive planets around nearby stars. And the idea is what would it take to do it for an Earth-like uh, planet around a sun-like star. Uh, and so here I'm just showing that you have to combine your understanding of the stellar atmosphere for the star, um, and then you have an understanding of the planet atmosphere if you're just doing this as a simulation. Uh, and then you can actually figure out the amount of, of carbon or, or methane in that uh, planet's atmosphere over time. Okay, so this one, because this is the end, I am willing to back out of this here. So I'm gonna stop this. So I'll make sure that, oops. Um, let's see here. Okay. Hopefully. This is the last thing I want to show you. Oh, man. Sorry, I thought this connection would be a little better. So this is it, the, the presentation's on the, on the web. So let's see, where are we? Okay. Let's do full mode. All right. <coughs> this doesn't work. I will just. All right. Uh, it's not going to work. Okay. Um, all right. Let me just leave it at this. So, <clears throat> finally, we have uh, man made chemistry. Uh, so, like I said, most of the elements are natural, but some of them aren't, right? And We've come a long way in producing those, uh, you know, plutonium, um, lawrentium, and a number of others. And then even more recently, we filled out uh, the nonmetals in Tennessee, right? So that's a, a recent discovery uh, down, done down at Oak Ridge. And uh, the last thing I would say is that um, I also work on societal chemistry, which is um, improving uh, the overall makeup of, of sciences in, uh, in the STEM fields. And so these are three of um, the students that I uh, helped to mentor in my program. Uh, and they're working on a wide variety of things. Some people, he works on observations of, of black holes and their activity 
Uh, Carl works on stellar binary fractions, so the fact that uh, most stars live in binaries. Um, but we, we see that when we look at star clusters, you get different amounts of these binaries, and that might have something to do with the star cluster ages. And then uh, George is working on um, observing signatures of planetary nebulas. These are the things that are left over at the end of a star's lifetime. So uh, with that, I will end it and open it up to further questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think since we have a next class coming in, oh, yeah, that, right. that if you want to ask Dr. Lee some questions, why don't we have you go Absolutely. maybe towards the back? Perfect. That would be thank great. You. But thank you.